Well, hello and welcome to our service for this fourth Sunday of Easter. We're so happy that you've chosen to worship with us today, uh, and we pray that you be blessed in this time of worship together. Uh, let us begin by singing together, uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine. from the shadows where we huddle with our doubts and our uncertainties God calls us here to this place and he meets us here and every moment where we look for strength to continue and every moment where we wonder whether our faith is real and can we trust it God calls us once again to this time of worship where he meets us here in this place let us pray loving God we come today once again seeking your healing spirit your care for this world and for us is greater than even we can imagine. You draw near to us in kindness and compassion and tenderness, regardless of our state or condition. You turn our weeping into laughter, our sorrow into joy, and even death into life. You redeem all that seems lost. In gratitude, we set aside this time to rest, to enjoy you, the beauty of your world, and the gift of life. Giver of all good gifts, we confess that our own generosity is so limited. We give, but often reluctantly. We shrink from costly discipleship, preferring cheap grace. 
Forgive our fleeting enthusiasm and our shallow commitment. Guide us in your way of joyful giving, a way embodied by Christ, who freely gave himself for all of us. Father God, your extravagant love has called us together in this time. Long before we even knew you, you already knew us and had chosen us to be a part of your own family, sisters and brothers with our Lord Jesus Christ. What amazing love you have shown toward us. And so we come before you with praise and thanksgiving, offering you the worship of our hearts and our lives and opening ourselves to the prompting and leading of your Holy Spirit. Receive our worship today, our praise and our prayers and our, and our offerings through the intercession of your Son, Jesus Christ. In the time we spent here in your presence, together yet apart, bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 27, and I'll be reading the first seven verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Amen. Let us sing the church as one foundation.
Well, now we come to our time for our mystery bag. And Heather, we have a mystery bag today. This is brought to you by uh, Joan Clements. So a shout out to Joan Clements. Thank you for your contribution to whatever you've put in here today. So let's open it up and uh, see what we find. We have a good housekeeping magazine. We have a novel, Safe Haven. And we have a Bible and a children's book. Uh, what is this? God's palette purple, the color purple. So we'll put the mystery bag back there. So we have four different types of reading material. And when I first look at this, of course, the first thing I think about is the Bible. When the, we, we call the Bible the word of life, or uh, Jesus Christ uh, calls himself the bread of life, and so that nourishes us. When we read the Bible, we're spiritually fed by that. But before we can do that, sometimes our other reading material, we have the children's book. So we start out here where we're not ready uh, for the uh, more difficult readings, perhaps. Uh, so we all have to start somewhere that Paul tells us in his letters, um, that when we were children, we had milk before we could eat meat. So uh, we have this uh, children's book, and then we think of this spiritually, we go to this when we want to read uh, something that's pretty easy to read. And then as we grow older, uh, and probably waiting in doctor's rooms or dentist office, we're reading magazines, um, usually from um, four years ago. But with this uh, good housekeeping magazine here, uh, it's... A little bit more difficult reading in the children's book but it's not something that nourishes you so if I'm gonna I was gonna liken this to food I think this would be the milk uh, I think this would be more like eating a chocolate bar it doesn't really nourish you it's it's not very good for you um, there's nothing wrong with it but um, you know what does what good does it do for your body so then Beyond the magazine, you come to the novel. So we all love to read novels to fill time, especially times like now where we're looking to do something and we read books. And again, we can read through it. It's a little bit more sustaining than the magazine and the children's book, but it's certainly not as sustaining as the Bible itself, uh, where we go to be spiritually fed for our spiritual food. So this would be like having the full meal the four course meal where you get all four food groups in it and it spiritually feeds you just as we are physically fed by the food. And I remember a story once, um, I was told this when I was a kid in Sunday school, that the minister stood up one Sunday morning and he said, uh, do you know what the most important Bible in the world is? Uh, and they didn't know. And uh, the minister said, the most important Bible in the world is a red Bible. Well, this one little boy was so excited because he had a red Bible. It was a color red. And he showed it off and bragged all his friends. And he said, you know what? I have the most important Bible in the entire world. The minister even said it on Sunday. Because if you don't have a red Bible, then your Bible isn't that important. And he went back the next Sunday and the minister said, you know, I think he misunderstood me. He said, I didn't say the color red. The most important Bible in the world is a well-read Bible. So I think... That's a good story to close with on. Thank you, Joan, for all this reading material. Uh, we'll get it back to you because you might need it uh, for a, a little while. Um, Heather, I'll just pass those off to you. And, and again, if you have an idea or a thought that you want uh, Heather to put in the mystery bag or you have something that you want to drop by the church and put it in the mystery bag, then feel free to contact Heather and we can set that up. So thank you, Joan, again for your idea today. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we come to your word and your message for us today, we pray that you would nourish us with your word, that we would give you glory in all things, that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In our second reading, 
comes from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 to 23. Moses said to the Lord, you have been calling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else would distinguish me and your people from all the other people in the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is the word of the Lord and the gospel of Christ. When it comes to our faith, we would like to have some certainty in our faith, I think. We've talked a little bit in the past few weeks about uh, to doubt. We've talked about Thomas and how he doubted. And we're going through such an uncertain time right now. Wouldn't you just like to know what the future holds? Wouldn't you like to know some answers? Wouldn't you like God to fill in some of the gaps for us of those things that we're wondering about or anxious about or worried about or fearful of? And when it comes to our faith, how much more would we want to have that kind of certainty? Sometimes we look around and we think, man, if I only had faith like that person. We see people that seemingly have great faith, and we think, I must be the only one here whose faith isn't all figured out. I must be the only one here who doesn't have this faith thing down pat. I might be the only one I know that has a pretty weak faith and not a strong faith. But when it comes to our faith, how many of us have it all together? Not many, if any. So we come to Moses' story today, and we see Moses' faith. And sometimes Moses had great faith, and sometimes Moses' faith, faith was very limited, uh, like ours is at times. You know, there's a story, which I'm sure you've all heard and I've told before, about these three clergymen who went fishing one day, and they got the boat right out into the middle of the lake, and the one forgot his lunch back on shore, so he stepped out of the boat and he walked across the water without getting wet and got his lunch and walked back across the water. And then the second minister forgot something, so he did the same, got out of the boat, walked across the water, walked back across the water without getting wet. And the third minister was so impressed with their faith. He said, if only I had faith like that. And he stepped out of the boat and he sank right to the bottom of the lake. And he couldn't walk in the water. And the other minister says to the second one, he says, maybe we should have told him where the rocks are. You know, sometimes we have faith like that, where it seems like we have a strong faith, but really that's not what's quite is going on. Now, instead of most, most of us struggle in an in-between place, between we know our faith is real, we know God is real, but there's times, most times maybe, when we feel like we're just clinging by our fingernails. You've ever seen that poster of that cat that's just hanging by its claws, and it says, hang in there? Sometimes we feel like that cat, that we're barely holding on. But do I have an answer for how to make your faith stronger? Well, there's lots of answers out there. But I think more importantly, there's something else we can learn from the story of Moses today. Because we all struggle with this. And Moses said to God, you want me to lead your people? First of all, he says, then send someone with me. Because he doesn't believe that he can do it alone. When he was first called, Moses says, I'm not your guy. Take my brother Aaron. I'm not qualified. But God called him anyway and promised him that he would be with him. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But first of all, Moses says, if you want to go, me to go, then you have to show me something. And we've been there before too. Show me a sign. Just show me a sign. There's a, the movie Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey. And there's one scene in that movie where he's begging God to show him a sign. And he's following a construction truck full of signs. 
that tell him to go this way or one way or that way, but he's missing it because he must be looking for a different kind of sign. So we beg with God all the time, just show me something. If you want me to have faith, if you want me to follow you wherever you, you go, then just show me something. Well, I don't know about you, but there have been times in the past where I've bargained with God. I think we all bargain with God at one point or another. You know, Lord, if you heal this person, if you heal this family member, Lord, if you get me this job, I'll be in church for the rest of my life. Lord, if you do this, I'll read my Bible every day. We make those bargains with God. And we see Moses making one of those bargains with God here in this place. And of course, there's our story. And again, the story my congregation has probably heard before. The story of a little boy, uh, and he wants a bike. And he says, you know, Lord, I'll, I'll be good for six weeks if, if you give me a bike. And uh, then he says, oh, you know what? Maybe I can't do that. I'll be good for four weeks. He says, no, I don't think I may. Lord, if, if I'm good for one week, give me a bite. And finally he decided he couldn't even be good for one week. So he went to the nativity scene in the living room. And he took Mother Mary. And he said, look, God, if you ever want to see your mother again, then give me a bite. Sometimes we make those bargains with God, but then there's sometimes we spiritually blackmail God. You know, uh, God, if you are a healer, like you have said you are, then heal me. God, if you are the one who says you'll never leave me or forsake me, then why do I feel so lonely all the time? God, if you are this, if you are that, we make those bargains with God. And uh, Moses is doing that here. He says, you know, if you want me to go, then you must go with me. You must show me something. And he, at the end, he says, remember, these are your people, God. They're not my people. They're yours. So he kind of throws that back on God, trying to spiritually blackmail God to get his way. And how does God respond to Moses bargaining, spiritually blackmailing, not sure if he's qualified? Does God show his wrath and his anger? Does God discipline Moses? No. He responds to Moses with this. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He responds with grace and compassion and most importantly, his very presence, he promises, will go with him no matter what he faces, that God's presence will be with him. And there's this intimacy in verse 17 where God says, Moses, I know you by name. And there's something intimate and special about God knowing our name. It means that God knows us. He's essentially saying to Moses, I know your fears. I know your anxieties. I know your worries. I know what's on your heart. I already know all of that. And I'm promising I am going to go with you. Remember, I know you by name. And he is also making a statement about the relationship he has with Moses, this personal relationship with God that all of us are invited into. The same is true for us when we struggle, when we face dark times or difficult times. God can say to us, I know you. I know you by name. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. I will go with you. My presence will be with you, and I will never forsake you. It might not feel like that right now for many of us going through this time. It might not feel that God is in control at all. It might not feel that God is with us or with, with you at home, wherever you're watching this. You might feel that God has abandoned us in some way, and we feel that way a lot. And that's all very well. You tell me, you know, Barry, that's okay for you to tell me that God is with me and God's going to go with me, but isn't there something more I can hang my hat on here? Isn't there some substance to what you can tell me? Because, you know, just telling me that God is with me, that's nice. But what does it really mean in a tangible way in my life? And we could get very frustrated if I left you with that here now, and I left you hanging. Moses wanted more too. So we, what do we see? We see Moses saying, show me, not just a sign, but show me your glory. Uh, we can relate to Moses even more now. Show me your glory, God. Show me some sign that you are with me. God, if you won't change my situation just yet, if ever, show me that you are here in a tangible way. Paint the sky purple. Put a rainbow directly over my house. Do something that I know you are here with me. Have you ever done that? Ask for a sign from God? Something tangible that God, and he knew it had to come from God and nowhere else. And I've told this story before about the pastor who got his cat stuck up in a tree and he couldn't get it down. And it was stuck on this kind of flimsy branch. So the pastor decided to tie a rope to the branch and he pulled the rope down 
but the rope gave way and the cat was hurled into the air, out of sight. He had no idea where that cat went when it took off from that tree. Well, on the other side of town, there was a little girl who was praying for a cat. And her mom said, I'm not giving you a cat. I don't want a cat in this house. And it's not coming from your dad. And it's not coming from me. The only way you can get a cat is if God himself gives you a cat. Well, no sooner had she made that prayer. And this cat came out of the wild blue yonder and landed in her lap. And the mother said, well, it obviously came from above. So I guess you can keep it. We always ask for those signs of glory. Isn't that what Moses is doing here? He's asking for something He's praying, begging God to show him his glory. But God says, okay, I'll do that. But you can't see me face to face. Because if you do, then you'll surely die. No one can see God face to face and live. And it's kind of one of those great get out of clause, get out of it uh, clauses of God. What is God doing here by telling Moses, you can't see my face? And Moses says, okay, whatever, whatever you can show me, I'll take it. Just show me something. So God promises to take Moses and put him in the cleft of a rock and God will pass by and Moses will not be able to see God's face, will not be able to see God. He'll just see the back of God. But the better translation for that is he will see where God had just been. Remember that verse that I just read to you from that passage that twice in it says you'll see where God passed by. I will just pass by and that's where you'll see me. And isn't that true in life, that when we see God most clearly, it's usually not in the midst of our difficulty. It's usually not in the midst of our pain and our suffering. It's usually when we look back on our life, we see God in retrospect. And we see God most clearly where he has just been. And it gives us confidence now. So we can look back in our life and say, God was with me then. God protected me then. And if he did it then, I know he can do it today. And if he was with me at that time, I know for sure, even if I can't feel it, that God is with me today. So often in life, we have to look for those places where God just was, where God was God in retrospect, not God in the present. There's times where we see God in the present, we experience that. There's times where we know God has our future. There's times we believe that. But most often, at least for me, I see God most clearly when I look back over my life and I see where God has been and not where he is. For me, this is an intensely important spiritual principle here. When we are in times of darkness and struggling with our health or grief or whatever it is we're struggling with or just struggling to get through this time that we're going through now, we know that God is in our midst. And God says, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to show you where I've been. And maybe when you look back over your day, there's a spiritual discipline called exam and E-X-A-M-E-N. And it's actually just a prayer that you pray at the end of the day. And when you pray that prayer, you're looking back at your day and you're looking for the places where you think you experienced God. And maybe you didn't experience in the moment, but you thank God for those moments where he was with you. And you can do that at the end of a day, at the end of a week, or where, whenever you want to do it. But do it at the end of a period of time and look back to see where God has been with you. And that's what Moses was doing here. He didn't see God right there in the moment. He wanted God to go with him. And it was only when Moses saw where God had just been, that he gained the confidence to do what God called him to do. God takes Moses and he puts him in the little crack in the rock and he passes by and shows him his glory. Our English text usually says that he saw his back, but Moses most likely just saw this glory of God where God had just been. I've used that practice, which I just told you, that exam and prayer many times, and I would suggest that you try that, experiment with it, pray at the end of the day, and be thankful for where God has been with you throughout this time, where God has just been. And here's the thing. If we don't take time to do that, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss God at work in our life, in our community, in our world. Because God is here. People ask, especially during this time, where is God? God is here. God is with those who are fearful. God is with those who are anxious. God is with the broken. God is with those who, whose faith feels so low and so uncertain right now, whose future feels so up in the air. God is with us in those times. And he says, I am with you. I will give you rest. I will show you my glory. I will show you where I've just been. And that 
is my encouragement for you today, that you take time to look back over the last week and see where God has just been for you. Amen. Let us now sing, To God Be the Glory. come before God in prayer let us pray God of hope when the world is bleak and dim you pierce the shadows with your light you help us see new things new possibilities new ways of being for hope there was despair for clarity there was confusion for a way forward there was a closed door and we give you thanks we pray today for those who feel hopeless for those who are sick for those who are mourning and grieving for those who are bent under the weight of heavy burdens in their life, may they know and receive your gift of hope. God of peace, all around us there is conflict in our world, our communities, our families, our closest relationships. We pray today for places where pain, violence, and cruelty seem to have the upper hand. May they know and share your gift of peace. God of joy, we give you thanks for moments of delight and occasions of celebration for happy gatherings, gentle solitude, pleasure given and received, for laughter, friendship, and love. As we do so, we remember those who do not know such joy, those who are alone or hurting. May they know and experience your gift of joy. God of love in Jesus Christ, you came among us, love incarnate. Jesus was a son, a brother, a grandson, rooted in a particular family, and yet his circle of love stretched far beyond that, including outsiders and sisters and brothers. Called to follow him, we pray for our own families, 
whether close or estranged. We pray for friends near and far away. We pray for our partners, our children, our parents, our elders. But we pray also for acquaintances, for strangers, for those very different from us, even for our enemies. Help us draw our circles wider, seeing our kinship and relationship with all people in your name. May we know and share your gift of love. Hear us as we pray in silence for those people in our hearts and our minds today. And as we also bring to you our own worries and burdens, God, hear our prayer. God of all time and space, you initiated the relationship of love and generosity with creation at a time before and beyond all of our knowing. Through the word and your spirit, you continue your eternal love for all people. Fill us with a deep and abiding awareness of your presence, your call, and your grace in our lives. Shape us into the people you have called us to be. Pour out your creative mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ and all creation. And give us a sense of your deep abiding peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go from here in the name of God the Father and the love of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Each of you go now in peace. Amen. so much for joining us for our time of worship today and we thank you that you could be with us and we pray that you and your families stay well and stay safe and again I thank Heather and Ruth and Dave for all of your contributions to making this work every week uh, take care everyone and blessings <laughs>